Good morning, guys. Welcome back. Monday morning. Hopefully you're awake. Let me know in the chat if you are here for this morning's stuff. heads up to people I have returned your assignments so you should have everything back at this point unless you've handed something in well late um, I'm gonna release marks later today on the front page so you can see what your like a current mark update just be aware that if you still owe me assignments your mark will just be an I there won't be anything listed there um, because I don't have any uh, ability to give you a mark yet because I don't have some major assignments from you so uh, if that's the case hopefully at this point you've made arrangements with me or um, well hopefully you've done that anyway I, if, if not I don't know what to say guys I, there are some people here that are still kind of uh, we don't need to get into this you know who you are contact me please if you still owe me stuff um, that being said, uh, I was really impressed by the quality of a lot of your Meiosis Live projects. Uh, they were really impressive. Um, please, when you get an assignment back, um, have a look at the comments. Uh, not just the ones that are on the rubric, but you can actually click on the assignment itself. Um, at the bottom of the rubric, there's a little spot on the bottom right where it says view, I think it says view inline comments. And so if it's a type of pres uh, a type of project where you are handing in a document, I, I leave comments, I often leave comments right on the document itself. So like right on your slideshow or right on your vocabulary list, uh, just to help um, mostly giving you feedback with like, if, if, if you didn't ace it, little pieces of feedback here and there, some hints, some tips, for how you can potentially improve it in the future. So, um, I, I just I realized over the weekend, or at least it was pointed out to me that not not every student knows that you can access those. So that that does exist. Uh, it's, it's I think the button says view inline comments. So, um, and that could be potentially very helpful for you. I've noticed that with the other class, uh, after getting feedback on their vocabulary list, the first two ones their third and fourth vocabulary lists are a lot better significantly significantly better and I think it's mostly because people are just realizing what they're missing from their comments hopefully from my feedback and uh, and adding to them and so um, significant improvements have been seen which I hope for uh, for everybody because I mean I obviously ideally everybody just aces the course that would be the ideal situation Okie doke. All right, so if you have a look at day 13, that's where we are. Um, you will need the new notes package. So if you, if you have a look over here, you'll see U3, Unit 3, Part 3, Circulatory System. Um, today is the day where we're just going to be finishing up uh, the end of the respiratory system. We're going to be looking at lung capacities to get started. Um, so lung capacity... Right at the end of the respiratory system. Let me pull the note up. So uh, we finished off last time uh, looking at these illnesses of the respiratory system. Hopefully, I think so. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me. What I'm uh, going to get you to do today, uh, just at the beginning of the day, is um, read page 443 in your notes. So 443, or in your notes, in uh, in the textbook, page 443. Uh, is going to go over different ways of describing the volumes in the lungs. Um, so for example, if you are just at rest, breathing in and out, there's a certain amount of air that goes in and out and in and out, shown in this graph right here. In, oops, where's my pencil? 
in and out and in and out and in and out. That's known as your tidal volume. So you can measure this right here. That volume right there is the tidal volume. Uh, you can also take in a big deep breath. You can exhale all the way. And uh, so you can measure that the, the total volume that you can like fit inside of your lungs with a deep breath and a deep exhale. Okay, that's known as your vital capacity. And anyway, this is gonna the the, the chapter is just gonna go through and describe um, what these volumes of the lungs are called. Okay, normally we would do a lab um, in the classroom with this. Um, we would measure these. I, I have, but I can't get you a spirometer, uh, and I. I, I try. I try to figure out a way for you to do it at home, but just the volume measurement component of it is I, I can't figure out how to do it. Um, I spent some more time thinking about it, but I, I couldn't figure out any way to translate this this lab into something you can do at home. So no, normally we would go through and, and measure your own lung capacity, compare it to a table of averages for somebody your age, uh, just so you could see what your lung capacity is like. It's also related. Uh, so it's related to your physical health, uh, if you have a respiratory illness, it may be impacting one of these volumes. Um, and it also has to do with your body size. So obviously a smaller person is going to have a smaller lung capacity. So anyway, we're not going to do the lab component because I, I can't think of a way for you to do it at home. But uh, and also at school, um, it's kind of a no no right now to be putting things in your mouth. I mean, we sterilize everything carefully, but um, whatever, the, the school's not going to be cool with me doing a lab where people put stuff in their mouth. So, uh, so we're going to have to put that one on pause and, uh, or I guess since we're never going back this year on permanent hold. And, uh, I'm just, these are just the volumes of the lungs that I need you to know. It's a little bit more dry than what we would typically do, but, uh, anyway, so you, you read 443, it describes each of these, and then you can just put a definition in there. These don't necessarily have to be in your own words. You can use the, the definition for them from the textbook, but um, attempt to do some some processing here of each would be really helpful for you. Um, okay, so that, that's part one, uh, the first thing that you're going to do. Um, as you're going through there, Keep in mind that you can add any of the any of that terminology to your animal structure and function vocabulary list. Um, you're also going to read chapter 10.3 in the textbook. So chapter Chapter 10.3 is all about diffusion. So we already spent some time talking about diffusion. That's sort of like my introduction to diffusion. In chapter 10.3, they're going to talk about a little bit about the idea of partial pressures. So um, I'm, I'm going to briefly summarize this right now because it, this tends to be a topic that is a little bit confusing for people. Um, if you've taken chemistry in grade 11, and maybe someone can tell me if you've, if you've already taken grade 11 chemistry, do you guys do uh, gas law and partial pressures? Like Boyle's law and stuff like that in grade 11 chemistry? I, I haven't taught it in a long time. I can't remember. Not this year. Okay, cool. Then it must be in grade 12 chemistry. You do it in high school, so it must, it must be grade 12 chemistry then. That, that, that's fine. Um, I, I was just curious if, if anybody had any background on this already. That, that's cool. So so you, you, you don't cover that in grade 11. That, that's not a big deal. So um, basically what partial pressure means is that um, let's say that the uh, volume, whatever, and then let's talk about the atmosphere. Okay, what's, what's the breakdown of gases in the atmosphere? Um, about 20, 21% oxygen. Let me make sure I get all these right. Did I say the others? Oh, 
textbooks, leaving the other part out. Okay, hold on, make sure I get these numbers right. Seventy eight per cent nitrogen. Point nine per cent argon. You don't really think about that one too much. And point one per cent other gases. And that and this is carbon dioxide is included in that point one per cent other. So what, what, when we talk about partial pressure, what we actually mean is that as a whole, if all of these, if the, if the air pressure, um, so, so you guys haven't talked about pressure in chemistry at all. We, you haven't talked about STP, standard temperature and pressure? That, that's never come up in chemistry? Actually, I'm a little bit surprised by that. Or you just haven't talked about Boyle's Law? You haven't? Huh. Okay. Well, anyway. Um, in chemistry, you typically measure pressure as uh, kilopascals. So 101.3. Oh, well, I got to restart this. It's going uber slow again. Jeez. What a pain. I don't know why it does that. There we go. 101.3 kilopascals. So that, that is no, known as the standard pressure. Um, which is the pressure at sea level, the air pressure. So that, that, that is how much the air around you is pushing in on you at sea level. Okay, it's a pressure measurement. Uh, you may have seen it written as one bar. So one bar is also a pressure measurement and that's, that's measured at sea level. Or uh, what would that be in PSI? You may, you may have heard of PSI before, pounds per square inch. That's if you're like inflating a bicycle tire or something like that. Um, I'm doing a lot of conversions here. Uh, what is 101.3 kilopascals in PSI? So that'd be 14.7 PSI pounds per square inch. That would be an American measurement, although we use it here all the time anyway. Uh, and then also uh, we use millimeters of mercury here. And that's 759.81 millimeters of mercury. We're going to talk about millimeters of mercury. Uh, it, it's, it's a pressure measurement that is typically used in biology um, for some reason. And uh, <laughs> it's a little bit of an archaic measurement system. Um, but um, you'll, you'll notice like when we talk about blood pressure, which I think we're going to get to later today or possibly at the beginning of tomorrow, um, we're, we're going to be discussing um, blood pressures in millimeters of mercury. So anyway, the, all of these numbers here represent the same pressure, just in different units, okay? So uh, I'm going to stick with kilopascals because that's what's mentioned in the textbook. Um, and so, so that, that's the pressure at sea level. That's how much the air is pushing on you at sea level. What partial pressure means is that the pressure of each of these gases, how much each gas, gas pushes on you, is the percentage of that gas in the atmosphere times the total pressure. So if oxygen makes up 21% of the atmosphere, then 21% of this pressure is the pressure of oxygen. That's how much oxygen is pushing on you. And that's actually what we care about the most. The partial pressure is basically, you can think of that as the same thing as the concentration of oxygen. And remember, what, when we want to get oxygen into our blood, let's go back to our alveoli here, we want, and then I'll draw a little blood vessel on the bottom, we, if we want oxygen to go into the blood, we have to make sure that the pressure of oxygen is higher here. We want the oxygen concentration here to be higher than the oxygen concentration in here, in the blood. And that, that's to ensure that we're always pumping oxygen into the blood. So, 
So the, the concentration of oxygen is the same thing as its partial pressure. Okay, that's what the, it's a measurement of that. So, um, for example, oxygen is 21% of the total air, okay? And we really only care about the oxygen component and CO2, but we're, we're, well, we're not going to worry about CO2 for this example, but um, we don't really only care about oxygen here. Nitrogen does nothing in the body and neither does argon. They're totally inert, so we can basically ignore them. So what is the pressure of oxygen? Well, it's the percentage of oxygen times the total pressure. And I'm going to use sea level here. I'm going to use 101.3 kilopascals. We're, we're, not, we're not at sea level here, but we're, we're moderately close to sea level. So it's, it's going to be fairly close to this. It's not going to be exactly the same, but it's going to be close. Okay. So what is that? Of course, I can't I'm going to be able to do that in my head, but I... Give you a pretty close estimate, but I'm just going to put it in the calculator. Twenty-one point two seven three kilopascals. Okay, which I'm just going to I'm going to short form here to just twenty-one. All right. So if you can imagine then the pressure of oxygen on this side, or the concentration of oxygen, is going to be twenty-one kilopascals and the pressure of oxygen the leftover oxygen in the blood vessel I actually don't know this offhand so I'm gonna have to look this up real quick so I want to know the pressure of oxygen in the venous blood so the venous blood would be the blood that is returning to the lungs to get new oxygen in it. So it is venous blood is 30 millimeters of mercury. So 30 millimeters of mercury to kilopascals is 3.94. Okay, it's four. So th that is the amount of pressure of oxygen that is in the blood. Okay, and rem remember that we talked about how because in diffusion, things are always gonna flow from high pressure to low pressure, okay? So in this case, we have high pressure oxygen in the alveoli, low pressure in the blood, and so we're going to get lots of flow of oxygen going into the blood and the lung, which is what we want, right? So that, that's how you determine how much actual oxygen pressure there is. When you go up to altitude, you don't actually change this value right here. The, the, par the percentage of oxygen at the top of Mount Everest is still 21%. You're not actually changing the percentage of oxygen in the air, but what you're changing is the total pressure of oxygen. So that's the other value, the 101.3. We're not at sea level anymore. So I'm gonna, uh, again, I'll look this up really quick here. I don't know what the pressure is at the top of Everest, but I'll find out. Pressure at the top of Everest. Man, the internet is amazing, isn't it? I'm gonna look this up in two seconds. Uh, 253 millimeters of mercury. So 253 millimeters. I could just I'll do this all in millimeters of mercury probably to be easier, but um, I'm going, to, I'm going to keep the reason I'm keeping kilopascals here as a unit of measurement is because in chemistry you use kilopascals all the time. It's it's, it's a chemistry standard. I thought you guys already learned that in chemistry this year, which is why I'm, I'm I was doing that. Um, however, maybe I should consider just using millimeters of mercury in the future. You you will learn it next year in grade 12 chemistry. So um, just so you have a point of comparison. So uh, that is 33.7. Okay, so when you go up to the top of Everest, this number is going to become 33.7 kilopascals. There is much, much less pressure of air when you get at altitude, okay? But the other number is gonna stay exactly the same. It's, it's still gonna be 21% oxygen, okay? So the total pressure of oxygen is now gonna be a lot lower, 0 0.21 times 33.7, okay? That leaves us only now approximately seven kilopascals, okay? So if you look here, instead of 21 kilopascals pushing oxygen into your blood, now 
there's only seven kilopascals of oxygen pressure difference. And if you have a lower pressure difference, well, you're going to end up with less oxygen going into the blood. There's still a difference, so some is going to go in, but it's so little that, I mean, it actually causes brain damage. So if you, if you are in a situation like that for an extended period, um, it's not going to go very well. So uh, anyway, that, that, that's the idea of partial pressure. Partial pressure just means that the pressure of a gas uh, in a particular situation is its percentage of the gas, uh, a percentage of the total gas, and times its total pressure. That, that's the partial pressure. So this what we're measure, what we're actually calculating here are the partial pressures of oxygen in these cases. Okay? So anyway, why am I talking about this? Because when you're reading this textbook chapter, um, chapter 10.3, it talks quite a bit about the idea of partial pressure in, in a biological context and why it's important. It talks a little bit about altitude. I just wanted to go through that calculation because most people, when they read this, uh, usually come by the Google Meet at the end and say, uh, I didn't get the partial pressure component of this. And so I'm just, this is like a little preview for you. So to help with the understanding of it a little bit. So anyway, it's going to talk about the idea of partial pressure a little bit. Um, it talks a little bit about the transfer of oxygen into the blood and out of the blood but into the cells. Um, and the last part here is it talks a little bit about the neurological control of breathing. So how do you actually control your respiration via your brain? And it's one of those really cool, unique systems. We mentioned this kind of when we talked about the, the control of breathing, that you have an autonomic component, which is basically it runs by itself. It is automatically controlled by your brain. Uh, but the, the breathing system is unique in that you can take over the autonomic system uh, pretty much at, at will and direct your breathing as well which we don't have a lot of body systems like that I mean digestion all those other things you, there's there's no way to take active conscious control of them so um, breathing is kind of a unique system and it, when you think about the uh, evolutionary benefits that having having a that manual control of breathing would give I mean it, it allows speech to occur we, we wouldn't be able to talk uh, or really communicate very well at all if we didn't have that conscious control of breathing. I mean, we wouldn't be able to regulate the uh, exhalation to in order to make sounds and things like that. So, so it's I mean, it's pretty pretty necessary for human development. It's um, pretty pretty strongly um, selected for in natural selection. Okay. Anyway, that's the chapter that you're going to read. Add uh, add terms as you go to your vocabulary list, and then there are a couple questions that go along with it. It's page four fifty one, numbers one to six. Okay, so and that just goes in your in your question document for this unit. The second component is I have a documentary for you called The Human Pump. It's a little bit old now. I think it's from the 90s. I think early 90s. So it's a little bit old, but I mean, this, it, that, nothing's outdated about it. The, the reason why I get you to wa watch this one is because it shows you a bunch of really cool visuals that I, d I really don't have access to. The coolest one to me is that it shows you what um, some uh, capillaries, which are the smallest little blood vessels, the ones that are going outside the alveoli or through all of your body tissues. And it shows actual red blood cells traveling through the capillaries, one by one, single file. And like I'm talking about like actual circulation, um, which is a fascinating visual to actually see a red blood cell transition through a capillary. And you can see in the visualization how narrow the capillary is and also the fact that it's transparent capillaries are so thin they're only one cell thick that they're transparent um anyway i i really it's a really awesome visual there's a bunch of other cool stuff in here too um but even just just for that one visual alone i think this is a really cool documentary um there is a a, a worksheet that goes along with it it's um it's in the it's in the notes package it's right here um so here are the questions. Uh, when you're done, if you're unsure about any of the answers, I did also post uh, some answers to the worksheet here. So I went through and made an answer sheet. Um, so that's available for you too. If you're like, oh, I didn't get the answer to this question, um, have, a, have a look in, the, uh, in my little answer scheme right there. So th that's what you guys are going to be working on in block one. Um, I, I, I'll be here as usual. So let me know if you're, you're going through the reading and you're like, I don't get what this is saying or... Um, I don't know, you have a question about the documentary. Pretty much anything uh, as you're going through or you did the exit quiz, you're not sure about something in the exit quiz, feel free to ask, please. 
Um, this afternoon, or I don't know, I'll call it this afternoon. You know what I mean. The second half, block two, um, we're going to start going through the notes package for the circulatory system. So we're going to talk. Oh. No, you don't have to put the uh, the worksheets in. They're they're there for you to uh, reference while you're writing the quiz. So I I, I anything that's not evaluated um, through the uh, assignments, I, I have to have some method to evaluate. So um, most of the information I'm evaluating through the through the quizzes that isn't evaluated through the assignments. So in other words, you should have your note package available to you while you're writing the quiz. And then you can reference, you can just reference these questions if you want. You can just look at them while you're writing it. Uh, normally, this would become sort of part of the body of knowledge where, that you note yourself. You would study for a normal unit test. But myself and my colleagues, I, I think we were kind of at a loss as to how to do fair testing in this environment. So we, I, I mean, again, I don't know what everybody's doing, but I know in the science department, um, we've been struggling to find a good methodology that is fair and equitable for testing. So I, I mean, right now I think the open book quiz um, strategy is fine. So I'm gonna use it. Uh, I know there are others using it as well. So I don't know if have you, have any of you guys had like legit tests that are not open book in your other courses, this block? And if so, how, how does that work? I'm, I'd love to hear this. I, I, I don't think there's a lot happening in science. Kin does. How, how, how do they keep you from cheating when you're writing it at home? I, I don't mean keep you from cheating, but like in, ensure that it's equitable. You do it on a Zoom. Huh. Fascinating. Really? Well, that's fascinating. I, I, my, my issue with the honor system, and it's not that I don't trust you guys, I do. But the problem with doing that is that there are going to be students that don't follow that, that just use their notes, do, you know, aren't going to follow the honor system. And how is that equitable to the other students that are doing their best and not doing that? I mean, it's, I, I feel like it's totally unfair to the students that are uh, abiding by the rules. Verbal tests. Now that's an interesting idea. Interviews. Oh boy, I feel like that would take forever if we did that in this course. That's an interesting idea though. Like an interview kind of style. Hmm. I'll have to think about that. Ho hopefully we won't have to even deal with this next year, but we'll see what, we'll see what happens. Uh, oh, cool. Thank you for your feedback, by the way. I appreciate that. I appreciate people actually answering. My, my strategy here is that I putting everybody on a level playing field, you can use your notes. I build the quizzes to be written as open book quizzes. So the challenge, the questions are mostly um, questions that are application questions. In other words, you're not just looking something up and writing it down. You have to apply the knowledge that you learned from the course in order to answer them effectively. And I, I personally think that that's fine. But uh, I know that the open book thing kind of gets under, uh, sticks under some teacher's uh, fingernails. In French, that makes a lot of sense. In French, that makes a lot of sense. In the languages, that I, I can definitely understand. And, and I, I agree with you, Brie. I feel like doing it in math um, <laughs> for a verbal test would be a little bit difficult. Um, maybe you could describe your understanding of a concept. I don't know. I, that one's probably not going to be as effective, but uh, interesting. OK, anyway, that's neither here nor there. Thank you. I appreciate everybody's feedback, though. Um, in block two. Like I said, we're going to get into the uh, circulatory system. I'm just, I'm just giving you like a very, very brief preview here of what we're going to do. Um, where is it? Body systems. Why does my iPad struggle with this so much? Can you guys see this? Oh, yeah. So um, we're going to go through a little slideshow together. We're going to talk about the different parts of the circulatory system. Um, we're going to get into what blood is made out of. We're going to talk a little bit about hemoglobin and red blood cells. We're going to talk a little bit about the immune system and white blood cells. Uh, we're going to go through the anatomy of the heart, which you may or may not have learned last year. Uh, and we're going to talk about the three types of blood vessels, arteries, 
capillaries and veins, uh, and a little bit about their anatomy and their function. So that's what we're going to get to in the second half. We're going to go through that stuff together. Tomorrow, which is actually the last day of the unit, we're going to talk about how you regulate your heartbeat. So we're going to finish up the circulatory system and talk about um, regulation of um, the heartbeat, uh, how you electrically control the beating of your heart. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about heart sounds. We're going to discuss how to read an EKG. Um, and uh, then we're going to cap that off with a little discussion about circulatory system disorders. So this is going to be tomorrow morning. And then tomorrow afternoon is, uh, I have a pre-recording of a fetal pig dissection. I don't have a fetal pig at home uh, to do. So you're welcome to watch that. It's basically a review of the systems by going through the pig. It's the fetal pig dissection that I did last quad. Um, so um, I just basically go through the different systems of the pig. Uh, you can see it fairly well. I actually did an okay job with the camera. So you can see a lot of the structures of the system. Uh, that, it's kind of optional though, um, I mean it's a video, so if, if that's not a great way to review the systems for you, then don't worry about it. Um, and, th and the second half is basically your time to work on your medical technology project if you haven't been able to start that yet. Okay, I'm going to start stop talking about this now because we're going to, you guys are going to do it now anyway. So um, you can find all of this information summarized right here anyway on uh, the day 13 tab. So I'm going to let you guys get started. Thanks for your feedback and I like I said, I'll be posting marks at some point today as well, so you can just see where you're at. Let me know if you need anything. Hey guys, welcome back for the afternoon, or second block, whatever. Um, please let me know in the comments if you are here. And then we'll get started. I wanted to mention, uh, if you look on the home page, on the front page of Brightspace, um, your marks are now posted. <clears throat> if you um, if you're missing a major assignment, I, I don't have a mark for you. I'm not able to formulate a mark for you. So um, if you've already discussed with me a, a timeline about getting back on track, great. That's cool. I'm glad you're working towards that. That's great. If you haven't, if I'm missing something from you and we haven't discussed a timeline, you need to contact me today. So you need to send me an email. You need to get in contact with me and let me know what is your date that I can expect the stuff that's missing. If you don't get on top of it, if you choose not to get on top of the assignments that are missing and don't contact me, I, I don't predict anything positive here at this point in the course. Keep in mind that we are coming up now on three-fifths of the way through the course. Okay, And so if I am missing major stuff from you and you're not communicating it with me, at this point, this is where it starts to become really problematic because tomorrow we're going to start the final uh, assignment for this unit, or at least officially start it. Things are going to start to stack and get piled up. It's a lot of work. Okay, It's a straight shot right to the end of the course, and so you're always going to have more stuff to do. So there isn't just going to be like a day off that you have to work on the stuff that you owe me. So I really don't want stuff to get stacked for you, and you need to start coming up with realistic timelines for yourself in order to get that stuff in. If you're not doing that, you're going to end up at the end of the course not getting this credit. Okay, It has happened before, unfortunately. I don't want that to happen to you. I want all, everybody in here to be successful. So if we haven't made arrangements and timelines for you to be completing, if you're not working towards a specific day and a specific goal, we need to talk today. Okay, I need to know what your day is and then you need to abide by that deadline that you're creating for yourself, okay? You, you make it reasonable, and then you actually have to do it. So please, gi give yourself every opportunity to get this credit. If you're not doing that, uh, we, we, need to we need to chat because uh, I, I don't have good vibes about where this is going towards the end of the semester. There are probably four or five people in here that are, of, there are concerned that should be concerned, that I am concerned about. Um, it, it's one thing for you to be communicating with me and having extended de timelines and then working towards those timelines. Like, that's totally fine. I understand that um, that's going to happen. But there are a number of people that are just ghosting me and that are not coming up with specific dates. They're not abiding by specific dates that they're setting for themselves. Uh, and then that has not worked out well in the past. And so, please please take the opportunity to talk with me. Let's 
work out a specific day, something for you to work towards and make sure that you get back on track again. Okay, I really, really want you to be successful. I know it's stressful and there's a lot of work going on here, but you're not making it easier on yourself by kicking the can down the line. If anything, you're making it way harder on yourself by pushing deadlines. So um, let, let's chat. Okay, please make sure that you're contacting me if you're in that boat and we don't already have a plan. We got to get something figured out. Here's on how to read the PDF with our midterm mark. Okay, so um, you find your student number on the left hand side. So it's a list of student numbers there in numerical order. Uh, and then you just read it straight across. So the, the categories are across the top. The first column is your overall mark, I believe. Uh, then there is two columns with uh, number of assignments that are late, number of assignments that are missing. I may have got that order wrong, but it's listed across the top. Uh, and then it goes mark for the unit, uh, and then your three marks specifically for that unit. So it would be, I mean, it, it's all labeled across the top, so if I could read it out here. So it's diversity unit mark, then vocabulary list, spotlight assignment, quiz, and then your genetic process is unit mark and then the three things that contribute to that unit mark a vocabulary list meiosis live and quiz it's all it's all listed across the top i think let me double check it should have formatted it correctly pretty sure i double check it let me let me check again That's right. So, so you find your student number on the left, and then you just read it straight across. Your the the entire uh, row is your row, and so each of the columns is labeled at the top. It tells you what it is. The number under your marks. Oh, that um, that's like that's the actual mark that you received out of the total. So, for example, the e vocabulary lists are out of twelve. So the number at the bottom is what you got out of 12, and then the top mark is just what that is in a percentage. So it just shows both. The, the reason why I show the overall unit marks um, separately is because they, um, they're not a straight average of the marks for that unit. It, the different things are weighted differently. So the the major assignment, like the Species Spotlight assignment or the Meiosis Live, is weight, weighted the highest. Uh, that's weighted the most. Uh, then the unit quiz is weighted the second most. And then the, diver the vocabulary lists are worth the least. They're still worth a significant amount, but they're worth the least out of the three. So it's not just a straight average of those. So what, what I show in like the diversity unit column is your weighted average for that unit. And, and your, your course grade is just an average of all of the unit marks put together. And so at the end, it'll be an average of all five unit marks put together. Now keep in mind that that mathematical mark that you see there is my starting point when I assign you a grade at the end of the course. What we're actually supposed to do is look at sort of like a graph of your grades, which is what I do, I graph them. Uh, and then I look at if there is any anomalous value. So if you have something that is like way out of character for you, you have, I mean, technically we're supposed to do for high marks. I don't really do it for high marks, but if there's really a, a low mark that is really uncharacteristic of you, like whatever, you, um, you had something really low at the beginning, some mistake or whatever, I usually don't count it. So I usually remove it from your average and then look at where your average sits then. That's what we are supposed to do um, I mean, not necessarily that exact process, but we're supposed to look at your most recent and your most consistent mark. Uh, so it favors the marks towards the end in, in case you have incremental improvement throughout the semester. Um, we're supposed to take that into account. And then we're also supposed to take into account um, the most consistent. So if there's stuff that's inconsistent with your normal performance, we take, are supposed to take that into account. That's right out of the grading document that's from the Ministry of Education. So so it's not, I, I know people like to a mathematical average because they, they just want it to be like a robotic answer, like this is what I have. And to be perfectly honest, most of the time, students are relatively consistent in their marks throughout the, the quad and they're relatively 
Um, and so the most recent and most consistent isn't really different from your mathematical average. So, so typically the mathematical average is what appears on your report card, if that's true. If it's not true though, if you have, have a change towards the end or um, there, like, like I can see a progression over the course, then I, usually, I take that into account as well when I'm marking. So it's not necessarily a straight mathematical average in that case. So just so you guys know, that that's, that's what we're all supposed to be doing then. So I, I know that teachers have a tendency to favor the mathematical average, especially in senior courses. Uh, no, no worries, Hannah. Uh, because um, there is like this feeling of unfairness around the subjectivity of a teacher like deciding in their professional judgment what they feel like the mark should be based on what's there but like that's what we are prescribed to do by the ministry of education like we are we are told that that is how marks are established it's not like it's um i i, and I understand in senior courses people don't like the uh, like how nebulous that process is like how exactly are you deciding that i mean we're, we're using professional judgment which is again what we're being paid to do so um I understand that's disconcerting for people. They don't like that. They just want like a mathematical number. It usually is the mathematical number determined at the end. But I just want you to know that there's a little bit of flexibility there. And I'm going to stop talking about that now. So anyway, uh, these are, um, uh, let's, uh, let, let's get into the content for the afternoon. <laughs> if you have any questions or you notice that there's a mistake on there, by the way, uh, you just, just let me know. It's no big deal. I can fix that quickly. Okay, so as I mentioned... Um, we are going to be using a slideshow. The slideshow is actually linked. I'll show you where it is. You, you don't have to have it open on your end like I'm going to have it open on my end. But um, Oh, actually, first of all, are there any questions from the content from the first half? Questions about partial pressures, neural control of breathing, um, or volumes? the various volumes that are measured of the respiratory system. Did anybody have any questions? Or, or really, or anything from the documentary as well. Although if you're asking about questions, uh, uh, about answers to questions from, from the sheet, that those are all posted. From the human pump. Can you guys see this? Why can't you see this? What's going on? Oh, that was weird. Hmm, that's working. So total lung capacity, Ivana, is the entire volume of your lungs. That is, if you were to like fill your lungs from the bottom to the top with water, that is the total capacity of your lungs. The vital capacity is less than that because you can't use 100% of the volume of your lungs. Because when you exhale, you can't actually completely squish every, uh, every alveoli and squish every um, bronchiole and remove every single little bit of oxygen from your lungs. If you did that, you would actually collapse your lungs uh, and then it, it, it's actually difficult to open them up again because it, they, there's some surface tension between the it, with the water that is actually coating those vessels. So if you actually collapse them all the way, that's a collapsed lung, it's actually very difficult to get them back open again. Um, there's like a resistance to them um, being opened back up. And so you don't collapse your lungs when you exhale. Even if you push out as far as you can possibly push out, you're not going to collapse them all the way. So there's a little bit of difference in volume between what you can actually use, your vital capacity. So that would be the if you breathe in as far as you could breathe in. And then you exhaled from there all the way as much... as much as you can possibly exhale. That volume is your vital capacity. It's the, the total amount that you can functionally use. But there's a little bit of volume left over that's not used, and that, that's what's in the total lung capacity. So anyway, there, there, there's, there's a minor difference between those two. 
because you can't you can't functionally use all of it. And so the actually it's not in this note; it's in the other note. The difference in between those two. Really? The difference between those two is the residual volume. So there is a little bit left over that's residual. Pressure gradient? A gradient just means a difference in pressure between two places. So if there's a pressure of 50 kilopascals here and a pressure of 20 kilopascals over here, then there's a gradient, a difference in pressure of 30 kilopascals. A gradient is just a difference between two locations. And it, it and that it can happen in pressures. You can have a pressure gradient, so a pressure difference between the two, or you can have a concentration gradient in a, in a solution where there's like a concentration of, you know, a thousand parts per million of salt over here and 10 parts per million of salt over here. That's a concentration gradient between the two. And things always flow from higher concentration or higher pressure to less concentration and less pressure. And the, great, the greater the difference between the two or the gradient between the two, um, the more pressure there is for them to equalize. The harder the push is to get them equalized, to, to get them to find equilibrium. Now, I'm, I'm kind of oversimplifying a little bit because I'm saying that a pressure gradient is just a difference between two sides. That is true, but it's important to note that a gradient implies that there are actually steps of difference between the two of them. There may be only one single step of difference. So if you're talking about transporting across a membrane, on one side of the membrane, it might be 50 kilopascals, and on the other side, it might be 20. So that's a that's a one step gradient between the two of them. But if this is a solution and there's no barrier between the two of them and you were to like put some um, salt in a solution right here, well, the concentration is gonna be really high right here. And then as you move away from it, the concentration is gonna get progressively less and less and less the further you get away from where you added the salt. And those steps of difference between the two is technically what a gradient is. That's a multiple step gradient between the two of them. Did I answer your question there, Jasmine? And if not, that's totally fine too. I can say that in a different way. Okay, cool. Any other questions from the first half? So like I said, uh, I'm going to be using um, the new notes package. So you should have that from, uh, it's right here, today's notes package. The, the questions from the video are on there as well. Um, and I'm going to be using this slideshow. So it says learning block two. I'll be using a slideshow for the note, link to copy here. You don't have to open that if you want, it's totally up to you. I'm going to use it, but you have reference to it if you want to go back and take a look at it at any point. So what we're going to do basically here is look at the anatomy of the circulatory system. So what parts are there? And we're going to look at the physiology of those parts, as in how does the structure of that part influence its role in the circulatory system? OK, some of these are going to be organs. So uh, we'll be looking at like physical pieces of the circulatory system. And some of those things are just going to be components of uh, like blood, although technically blood is an organ too, but we don't really think of it as an organ, but it is. Anyway, let's have a look. So a circulatory system in general has three components. Um, we have a closed circulatory system. All mammals have a closed circulatory system. And in fact, many uh, vertebrates actually all vertebrates have a closed circulatory system. And closed just means that you have a pump, you have vessels for the for the fluid that you're pumping, and and it is a, it's an enclosed system. So it's 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 basically the same as having a water pump and having pipes going around that return back to the water pump again. That's a closed system. In other words, no leaks. <laughs> Uh, not all animals have a closed system like that. So you, you get some weird situations that happen in like insects where 
you like I'm going to use the grasshopper um, as an example. We actually used to do a grasshopper dissection as part of this course. Um, but if you look inside like the body of the grasshopper, the heart is kind of more more just like a fan almost. Uh, and then there's a bunch of fluid that is just sort of loosely circulating inside the cavity of the grasshopper. There, there's no vessels per se. There's the heart is just sort of just like a fan that circulates the liquid around inside the insect. And a lot of insects have a circulatory system like that. So they don't have vessels to carry it. Uh, and so that, that's that's sort of the big difference between um, invertebrates and vertebrates. For the most part, invertebrates don't have a complex system of vessels. Now that's not true for every invertebrate. Uh, worms, for example, uh, annelids, and then there are other there are other invertebrates that have this, but they, they have more of a true vessel system, and they also have more of a true heart. Although uh, annelids have multiple hearts, but um, or at least multiple pumps within the heart complex. It's not like a single heart. Anyway, we don't do a worm dissection anymore. We used to, to do it as a comparison. But uh, to be perfectly honest, I, I personally stopped doing the um, invertebrate dissections because the parts are really hard to see. And in the end, people got very little out of them. It's basically just like you open them up and there's a bunch of goo. You can see it. It is possible if you really take your time. You can you can pick out the organs and really figure out what's going on inside. But the amount of effort that it takes to really carefully dissect them and to actually see all the different components and do a comparison to vertebrates, it, it, it's really time consuming and difficult. And and for after surveying students for many years, um, what we what I ended up figuring out from it is that no one learns anything when you do <laughs> the invertebrate dissection, or at least very, very few people take anything away from it. So I don't typically do them anymore, um, and we can't do them anymore anyway in this, these circumstances, although I guess you could just find an earthworm if you wanted, but uh, that'd be weird. We're, we're not going to do that. Um, uh, we did do a um, dissection of a, we used to do a squid, now that one is much more useful. Uh, if they're a lot larger, and you you can you can really pick out the anatomy inside of the squid, uh, and do a comparison between that and uh, vertebrates. Um, but again, well, we can't do that right now anyway, so it's uh, it's off the table. I don't know why I'm talking about this. I just <laughs> I'm hearkening back to the days where we did lots of dissections in this course. Um, so some are more valuable than others, but anyway, there there is an insect system is more like a fan blowing stuff around inside. So when we talk about the stuff in this slideshow, I'm almost exclusively talking about vertebrates, and more specifically, I'm really talking about mammals. Uh, when we talk about like the parts of the heart and the configuration of the heart, um, that's all mammalian. Um, and every mammal really more or less has the same shapes, uh, the same anatomy for that for that component. Although you can you can broadly generalize most of this stuff to all vertebrates. If you were to look at a bird, for example, a bird is going to be put together almost exactly the same as this with a little bit of difference in the anatomy of the heart. There's three chambers instead of four, um, but it's relatively similar. Like if you opened up a bird heart, you'd recognize it. Like you could you'd be able to tell what was going on in there if you, if you knew a mammalian heart. So anyway, but this is specific to mammals. So three components. You got to have a fluid for moving stuff around on uh, all kinds of stuff that we transport in that. And we'll talk about that in more detail. You need some vessels, which are some tubes to pump stuff around. We have a closed circulatory system, so you need a tube going to every spot in the body. And um, we'll talk about how that system of tubes works as well. And then you need a pump. And we're going to talk about the anatomy of the pump in detail as well. That I'm really going to miss doing. We used to always do a heart dissection as part of this course. And it is, uh, it's fantastic to really see the tissues of the heart, see the valves. Um, I, I, so that's a that's a real bummer that we can't do that one. That that one I think is really valuable. People get a lot out of that. Um, oh well, no 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 need to harp on it. It is what it is. So anyway, why do you need the circulatory system? Well, so far we've talked about uh, getting stuff into the body. That's in the digestive system and the respiratory system. So digestive, you are getting. Uh, nutrients in to the to your circulation and in the respiratory system you're getting gases in those are the two things that you need for cellular respiration the gases and the nutrients 
Um, and we've also talked about getting waste products out, waste gases out. Now we didn't talk about getting nutrient waste out, like urea and uric acid. That is the, the role of the excretory system, which is your kidneys, ureter, bladder, etc., cetera, uh, which you, you do a unit on in grade 12 biology. So if you're interested in that, in the sort of the filtration of the waste products and your kidneys and how they function, that's, uh, that's part of the grade 12 biology course. It's a uh, pretty interesting actually, um, but we're not gonna get into it here. But anyway, there's obviously the middle part here is just moving that stuff around your body, which is the role of the circulatory system. So what are all the things that you move? Well, food. So we talked about absorbing sugar, amino acids, a little bit of fat. So you do transport fat around in your circulatory system attached to cholesterol molecules, LDL and HDL. Um, however, there is also fat transport going on in your lymphatic system, which again, we don't really cover in this course. The lymphatic system is sort of a separate circulatory system that doesn't have a pump. Um, but yeah, some fat is being transported in there. Uh, you carry oxygen, as you already know, you got to send oxygen to all your cells. You got to carry CO2 away from all of your cells uh, and, and to the lungs to get it out of there. You got to carry all the cellular waste. So keep in mind that you're constantly cycling through nutrients. You're building proteins all the time in your cells, but simultaneously, you're also breaking down proteins all the time. They become dysfunctional over time. They get oxidized. You got to be constantly breaking down the malfunctioning proteins, uh, which become waste products that you have to remove. So, uh, and that's the job of the kidneys, but it's being transported in the blood. You have to maintain your temperature and pH. People always forget about this function. Um, when you get really hot, you sweat. What is sweat? It's the liquid part of your blood. It is the, that, that's what, where the liquid is coming from. It's coming out of your blood. And so that sweat response is circulatory. You are pumping blood to the blood vessels on the surface of your skin or close to the surface and you are removing liquid, the water component of your blood, that's sweat. So it's really important in temperature regulation. And the there's a pH component as well. Um, we, we already kind of talked about this, but the pH of your blood is really important. Certain cells um, are really pH sensitive. That's how acidic the blood is. They're really sensitive to that. Uh, neurons especially are very sensitive to pH. Uh, and you can regulate the pH by controlling how much carbon dioxide is dissolved in your blood, which we, we talked about previously, so in the respiratory system. So pH is being maintained through the, bl um, through the blood. Uh, there's a clotting mechanism. We're gonna talk about that in more detail, which is basically to plug holes in the system when it gets holes. Uh, part of your um, ability to transport um, white blood cells around, which is the immune system function, is happens in your blood so you can transport white blood cells they're also transported in your lymphatic system um, but they it, it works together with your circulatory system so a big part of it is circulatory as well and lastly we talked about this idea of signaling cells need to send messages to each other and when they're not doing that through nerves which is sort of like the instant or almost instant way of sending a message if you want to send a long-term message like hey you need to go through puberty for the next eight years or whatever a long-term message, well, that's much better accomplished with a hormone, a chemical messenger that you can send in the blood. Or over the next hour, I want you to start taking up sugar out of your blood because this person has consumed a bunch of sugar. Well, that type of message is better sent through a hormone. And so a lot of the chemical signaling that's going on is actually happening through the blood uh, through hormone signaling. Plus antibodies. We mentioned that very briefly way back when we talked about viruses, but antibodies are those little flags that your immune system makes for the bad guys, uh, and they are just floating around in your blood, and so they can get stuck to the bad guys that are also floating around in there. So this is a simple breakdown of the circulatory system. We have uh, what's known as a two-loop system. This is for mammals specifically, although it applies to most vertebrates. Um, you have two loops. So you've got a right side of this system, that's this, the part in blue, that is for dealing with deoxygenated blood, okay? So that is blood that is leaving your body's cells. It has all of the waste products in there, including carbon dioxide. It gets returned to the heart. Then it gets pumped out to the lungs. 
Uh, so that's the right hand side of this system. The right hand side is all um, dedicated to um, waste removal, really, and returning blood to the heart. And then you have the left side of the heart here, which, or the left side of the heart and the left side of the circulatory system, which is devoted to oxygen, oxygenated blood. So sending new oxygenated blood to your cell. So you got, you got the uh, oxygenated blood coming back from the lungs and then getting pumped out to all of the different cells of the body distributing oxygen. Now keep in mind when I say left side here and right side, I'm not talking about the left side of your body is devoted to one and the right side is devoted to the other. Now that holds true for the heart because the left side of the heart is devoted to this and the right side of the heart is devoted to this, but these blood vessels run basically beside each other. Um, the left hand side of this system usually runs um, very deep in your tissues. Um, that's the arterial side. Um, so it's usually running close to the bone, whereas the left hand, quote unquote, left hand side of this system, the return system is the venous system, and that is running fairly close to the surface. But I mean, they're running parallel to each other pretty much. Um, just one is closer to the surface than the other. So it's not like one half of the body is devoted to this. And yeah, I, just, I just wanna be clear about what left and right side means. You'll also notice that there's two circuits, basically two loops. So you have one loop that is all of your body cells doing stuff and uh, or it goes the blood is going to all of your body cells and then being returned to the heart that's called the systemic loop or systemic circulation that's going to the systems of your body and then you also have a separate loop that goes up to the lungs and back from the lungs it's a separate completely separate loop of blood and that's known as the pulmonary loop or pulmonary circulation Pulmonary, anytime you see the word pulmonary, it means of the lung. So pulmonary loop is just the loop that goes to the lung. All right, what's in the blood? What do we actually have in our blood if you were to break it down? Well, there are four main components. The plasma, which is the water component. White blood cells, which are known as leukocytes. You should know that, by the way. The technical term for white blood cells is leukocytes. Those are the... Um, immune cells, platelets, which are basically a patch kit for fixing holes in your circulatory system, and red blood cells, otherwise known as erythrocytes. Erythrocytes are the oxygen and carbon dioxide transports uh, that are in the blood. So they are cells that are specifically devoted to transporting oxygen and carbon dioxide. So we used to do this lab, I can't even believe this, um, when I started teaching, which yeah, is only, I mean, I guess nine years ago is a long time, but um, I started teaching nine years ago. Right, the very first year I started teaching, we still did human blood labs <laughs> in high school, where students pricked a finger, sampled their own blood, uh, and then we used to spin the blood down in these little tubes called capillary tubes. Uh, so that you could look at the percentage of your blood that was red blood cells, the percentage that was the buffy coat, which is, we'll talk about in a second, and the rest is what, pr pretty much water. Uh, so we, so we do not do any human tissue, human fluid labs any longer, um, for obvious reasons. Um, it, it kind of blows my mind that we, we did that in the relatively recent past, but uh, obviously due to lawsuits and all kinds of issues with using human blood, uh, we don't do any human blood stuff or any human tissue stuff any longer. But you probably will still do this in university. So a lot of university labs are, are better equipped uh, to take human blood samples. Uh, I did this lab in my first year of university. Um, I, oddly enough, I didn't do it when I was in high school, but I did do it in first year of university um, where I spun down my own blood just to see what was in it. So when you do that, when you spin it down, uh, see what I can't zoom in on this. That's kind of annoying. I should find a different way to present this, maybe with a, a PDF or something. But anyway, you can see it over there on the on the uh, right hand side. How, the breakdown, the plasma component, which makes up about fifty five percent of your blood by volume. So fifty five percent of the volume is just plasma. Um, it'll be on the next slide here exactly what the components are of plasma, but it's mostly water. So it's water with some dissolved solids, and some proteins and stuff in it but mostly water. Um, if you've lost a little bit of blood volume, especially in an emergency situation, 
I can always just give you plasma. Plasma is a nice, easy thing to give you. And if you're really in a hard spot and you don't have access to plasma, you can give people just saline, which is basically salt water. As long as it's the right uh, osmolality, as long as it's the right amount of salt that's in the water, the right concentration, you can pretty much just give people salt water um, if they've lost a little bit of volume. Now, if you've lost a lot of blood volume, you're going to be really low on red blood cells, in which case you're going to need an actual blood transfusion. But uh, but for minor losses, uh, like de and like dehydration and things like that, they could treat you just by giving you a little bit of plasma. So um, that's the water-ish component. The bottom part here, the erythrocyte layer, is the volume that is made up by red blood cells, which are for transporting oxygen. And you'll notice it makes up a significant proportion of your blood. This is why your blood is red. Okay, so what you're seeing in the blood is the red blood cells. That's the red part. Um, and that's because uh, hemoglobin reflects the red part of the spectrum and it absorbs the blue-green-ish part of the spectrum. So it appears red. Um, erythrocytes are made uh, in your um, bone marrow. So in your bones. Uh, you know what? I'm actually going to leave it because we're, we're going to talk about it on a different slides. So why don't I give you a, a little bit more detailed breakdown? I know some of this stuff is on your sheet. So if you look at the plasma component, which makes up, again, the bulk, uh, mostly water, a little bit of protein, globulins, fibrinogen, regulatory proteins, communication proteins, um, growth factors, you know, communication hormones, all, all of those things that make up little teeny tiny little bits of the, of the thing by weight. Uh, and then you got some other stuff dissolved in there, salt, sugar dissolved in there, not very much, but a little bit of sugar dissolved in there. Uh, you have dissolved gases, so some oxygen and carbon dioxide is actually dissolved in the water, although not very much, but there is some dissolved in there. And then you got your waste products, urea, uric acid, uh, those are the cell waste products, and they, they make up a teeny tiny little bit of what's in the blood. So that's, that's what's in the plasma. Um, the erythrocytes, as I already mentioned, uh, make up a pretty big bulk there. Uh, they are teeny, teeny, tiny. They're the smallest cells in the human body. If I want to show you a size comparison here so you can see this. Cell size comparison. I want to show you a comparison that has bacteria on it as well. Here we go. This is pretty good. This is pretty good. Um, yeah, this is actually a pretty good diagram. So we've got um, a red blood cell, which is about 8 micrometers in diameter. Teeny, teeny, tiny. And then in comparison, there's a skin cell. So a skin cell is probably an, about an average size cell. Um, and it's maybe about 50 times the volume of a red blood cell. So red blood cells are considerably smaller um you'll notice by the way uh really cool there's an x chromosome over there it's about seven micrometers in diameter and you might be wondering what the heck x chromosome is that big yeah keep in mind that x, the x chromosome is one of the largest chromosomes but how do you pack all of that dna into a red blood cell right because it's so teeny tiny well red blood cells don't have uh, nuclei in them. They're enucleated. So they actually don't have any DNA in them. Uh, and so you might be wondering, well, how does it do all of the things? You know, DNA tells it to, you know, make all the proteins and so that it functions and whatever. True. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't do any of those things. And so when the proteins in a red blood cell start to break down after 10-ish, 12-ish days, uh, they start to die. So they don't actually last very long in circulation. I don't know what the actual total lifespan is. Maybe it's like 16 or 18 days. I got to look this up, but it's fairly short. Um, and then when, once they're done, they're done. So they, they don't do mitosis. Um, they, they're produced by uh, these progenitor cells um, that are in the um, bone marrow. 
but they don't actually pass a nucleus on to the red blood cell. So it's that's kind of I think that's kind of cool. They're they're enucleated. They're one of the very few cells in the human body that does not have a nucleus, but they're teeny tiny, so they can't really fit one. Just in comparison to see what a sperm cell looks like, I mean, sperm are actually extremely small. So they're, the actual head of the sperm is roughly the size of a red blood cell. It's actually a little bit smaller than a red blood cell. Um, but if you include the tail, it's kind of unfair, but the, the tail is quite long. The, the uh, flagella is quite long on, on the sperm cell. But, but that's the same um, size that we're talking about here when we're talking about sizes. A sperm cell and a red blood cell are relatively close in terms of the actual cellular size. But if you compare a sperm to, for example, a skin cell, yeah, skin cells far and away larger than both of those things. That giant thing that you see at the top there is actually an egg cell. Uh, so that's the comparison. We, we already mentioned this, the idea that an egg cell is much, much bigger than a sperm cell. It also happens to be much, much bigger than an average cell in the human body by several orders of magnitude. Okie doke. Um, oh, this is also kind of a cool size comparison, just so you can see. Um, that uh, bacteria, remember, which are prokaryotes, right, are much smaller than a typical eukaryote. And so if you look at a typical bacteria cell compared to a red blood cell, which is the smallest cell in the human body, um, you'll notice that it's even smaller by, again, by an order of magnitude. It's the tenth the size or even smaller than that. Um, so prokaryotes are very small. And if you going back to viruses i don't know if i mentioned this when we talked about viruses but like if we look at a um let's see something that is roughly the size of a coronavirus okay so like this polio virus is on the same uh, order of magnitude as a um as a coronavirus if you compare it to the size of an average bacteria viruses are even again a step down another order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude smaller so anyway, i just think that's fascinating so they're teeny teeny tiny And then we've also got that little coating in the middle here. It's called the Buffy coat when you do the spin down. And the Buffy coat um, it has platelets, which are used for clotting. And then it has several different types of white blood cells that have different roles that you 100% don't need to know in this course. But they are have immune function. They're making antibodies. They're eating invaders. Etc. Etc. Don't worry about their names. You don't need to know the names of them in this course. Uh, we'll save that for grade 12 biology. <laughs> Sorry if I'm making grade 12 biology sound so intimidating. It's it's really not. It's just like the next step of knowledge here. Um, it's it, it's not overwhelming in the moment, but it we you do go into quite considerably more detail on a lot of this stuff. I know we already talked about this. Um, just a little bit more detail on red blood cells here. Remember that they're called erythrocytes. I, also, I mentioned already that they're made in the bone marrow. Um, they're enucleated. They lose their nucleus of maturity. And that the shape of them, this like inner tube shape that you see here, is called a biconcave disc. That's not actually a hole in the middle. It's just like a concave part. It's concave on both sides. Um, and that's called biconcave, concave on both sides. Um, the The reason that they have that shape, well, there's there's multiple reasons, but... The biconcave part right in the center there is where you find the hemoglobin molecules. So there are many hemoglobin molecules in the red blood cell, and it's sort of just like a storage area for oxygen. It also, uh, that round shape around the outside, also has the added benefit of being very squishy. You can squish the cell pretty easily, and which keep preserves the shape of the red blood cell. Because remember that it's getting crammed through all of these tiny blood vessels all the time. And an inner tube shape actually doesn't get hung up or stuck on the insides of the tubes. So it kind of assures that the cell is just going to keep going on its path. Eventually, it's going to get squeezed through even teeny tiny little vessels. It doesn't get hung up. Now, there's an illness called um, sickle cell anemia, which I can't remember if we talked about. It. I don't think we did. Um, I, I think we talked about it in the previous course when we go into some, some of these illnesses in more detail. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we talked about it in genetics we might have touched on it in one of the homework questions but sickle cell anemia is when you have some red blood cells that are sickle shaped they actually get they're spiky basically they don't have this inner tube shape any longer and one of the side effects of that is they get stuck like you can actually get some of the sickle cells stuck in capillaries which causes inflammation and all kinds of problems uh, poor circulation in that area so anyway, the shape is important. 
Uh, it helps squeeze and actually prevents damage to your um, blood vessels because you get these nice, soft, squishy tubes, uh, inner tubes that you're pushing through. And they're for gas transport. So in the center here, um, you've got hemoglobin. Now, I think it was mentioned in the video how many hemoglobins are actually in a red blood cell. It's a lot. It's a really high number. I'm going to just quickly look on that sheet. I don't remember. I don't have it in this note, but I forget how many there are. I know, I know I wrote it uh, as one of the questions for the documentary, so I'm going to pull that up. Two hundred and seventy million. <laughs> That's a big number. There's two hundred and seventy million of these in each red blood cell. Yeah, crazy, eh? Now, each one of these has four heme groups in the hemoglobin, and each heme group holds an oxygen molecule, an O2. So you've got 270 million of these in every red blood cell, and each red blood cell has, or each hemoglobin has four heme groups, and in each heme group, you carry one oxygen molecule, okay? It says atoms, that's actually, oh, that's a, I found a typo in there. This should say oxygen molecules. because it's an, it's an O2, it's not an atom, it's not a single O, it's, it's an O2 molecule that's actually being held in each one. Um, so that's that's a typo. So let me, I should do the math on this. I should be able to do the math in my head, but I'm not gonna. So 270 million times uh, four would be a, roughly a billion. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah, so each, each red blood cell is carrying approximately a billion oxygen molecules. There you go. That, that's that's pretty easy to, to sort of work out there. So that's a lot. Um, when it is actually carrying an oxygen molecule, uh, or millions of oxygen molecules, um, it changes the configuration of the hemoglobin slightly so that it reflects a different part of the spectrum. So when, when it's not carrying... Uh, very many oxygen. It's always carrying some, but when when it's deoxygenated, so it's it's dropped off most of its oxygen, it changes the configuration of a bunch of these. And then once once they do that, they start reflecting more of the blue part of the spectrum. So blood looks a little bit different when it doesn't have oxygen attached to it, um, relative to when it does have oxygen attached. So if I can show you what that looks like here, um, see if I can find a photo of that. Yeah, there's a good photo. Yeah, so on the left there, you have some deoxygen. Oh, actually, no, that's bound to CO2. That's not what I'm looking for. This is better. There we go. Oxygenated versus deoxygenated. So the first thing that should strike you here is that, well, first of all, oxygenated blood looks different. It has a different color. Um, it's bright red versus deoxygenated blood, which has sort of some purple undertones in there. It's like a darker red. It's really just darker red, uh, but it has sort of some purplish overtones but the, but what you should really notice here is that it's not blue <laughs> that is one of the biggest misconceptions about circulation that i hear constantly constantly not just from students by the way from adults everywhere that they think that venous blood deoxygenated blood that is returning to the heart is blue it is not blue okay it is very far from being blue i i, I wouldn't i don't think you'd call that color on the right hand side blue so i think the problem with this is because everybody looks at these diagrams all the time in every textbook. Every textbook everywhere shows deoxygenated blood as being blue on diagrams. So here, all, everything in blue here is basically the transport of deoxygenated blood. And so when you do that, uh, people start to think that it is blue. <laughs> just, so I just want to be really clear about this. Deoxygenated blood or blood that does not have oxygen attached to it any longer, or at least less oxygen, um, is not blue. It is just a slightly different shade of red, a darker shade of red, maybe with some purplish undertones, but it's definitely not blue. I think the other reason that people have this misconception is that if you look at veins, uh, which, and you should probably be able to see some of these in your forearm right now. I've got some nice big blue ones on there. But, <coughs> excuse me. You'll notice that they look blue. Yes, they do look blue. 
the reason that they look blue is not because the blood contained within them is blue. It has to do with additive color theory, which, again, this is probably somewhere in the back of your mind from grade 10 uh, optics. But there are a number of layers of tissue on top of those um, veins. Uh, and when you add up all of the different colors of light that the layers of tissue above absorb, uh, plus the color of light that's being absorbed by the vein itself, what's left over to be reflected is more on the blue side of the spectrum. So it's not the vein itself that's blue. If, if you were to, and don't do this, but if you were to, you know, remove a vein and have a look at it, it's not blue. It's just a darker red. But if you add a bunch of other layers of tissue on top of it, yes, it does look more blue. Um, so, it, but that's, it's, it's basically just an optical illusion. The, the blood inside is not blue. Okay. I just want to make that really clear because this is very, very common misconception. I already mentioned this idea here. White blood cells, leukocytes, they defend against disease, they destroy invaders. They have this really cool capacity to walk, to actually physically walk around on the inside of your circulatory system. They can be directed to different areas of your body. They follow hormone signals. Um, and so if you're having an inflammatory response, uh, let's say that you have a cut or something and you've initiated an inflammatory response, you've got red swelling around the cut, uh, which is caused, by the way, by all the hormones that are released from the cells being ruptured in the cut. Um, white blood cells will follow that signal like a bloodhound. They will go to those where those hormone signals are being produced. They follow the concentration gradient of those hormones, and they will congregate in that area. And, of course, that's totally adaptive because um, they are arriving to kill any potential invaders that have showed up in that cut. And usually there are multiple because you're now you're getting bacteria into your system from the external environment. So you want your white blood cells to show up and start getting rid of all of the um, things that you don't want in that cut. So anyway, I think that's really cool that they can kind of walk around on the inside of your blood vessels. They can they have directed movement, basically, which is really cool. They can follow concentration gradients. They also produce a bunch of enzymes that destroy viruses, that make antibodies, et cetera, et cetera. We kind of talked about this already. Platelets are cells. They are very tiny. They're also enucleated, so they're one of the other few cells in the body that don't have a nucleus. And if you look at them, they're roughly the same size as red blood cells, um, which don't have room for DNA inside of them. So well, that explains why they have no nucleus. Um, and they initiate the clotting um, cascade of hormones, uh, which is a process that is used to plug leaks. Okay, they don't live for very long, about 10 days, even shorter than red blood cells, in which case they, uh, they get broken down after that and their parts are recycled. But I want to talk a little bit about how the clotting mechanism actually works. So when you break cells, okay, and this happens all the time, you bump your elbow into something, you have cut yourself, even if you, even if you just have a bump where you bump something, you, 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 minor, you create minor damage to the capillaries and the small blood vessels. Um, this, this happens all the time, even just from small jostles and bumps. But they're usually repaired so quickly that you don't notice them. And they don't cause bruising, uh, assuming that your uh, clotting mechanism is working properly. So you have a break in some cells. A bunch of proteins are going to get released from the break uh, that aren't supposed to be there. And um, platelets will aggregate around those proteins. So they will start to stick to the area around where those proteins are being released. Okay, so they are the they are the first responders. They arrive there and stick, and they it, they um, are able to. They send out a second hormone, okay, called thrombin. And what the thrombin does is it converts another protein that's floating around called fibrin. Fibrin is basically just like if I had to describe it they're almost like pieces of spider web <laughs> um I sh sorry i should i should say fibrinogen fibrinogen is floating around in your blood all the time they're like these wispy little pieces of spider web okay you also make these they're not really cells they're more like proteins uh that are floating around they are proteins that are floating around that are sort of these just they they're wispy 
and normally they're not sticky. So fibrinogen is not sticky. It doesn't stick to anything. It, 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 it looks like a spider web, but it's not sticky yet. But when it receives that chemical messenger from the, um, from the platelets, which is thrombin, it will convert its shape into a slightly different shape that is sticky. So the sticky version of it is called fibrin. And once it's sticky, it'll basically just stick to the nearest thing. <laughs> it gets kind of hung up around the platelets and it gets super sticky. It sticks to platelets, it sticks to the surrounding fibrin. And what you start to do is you start to build a patch. So all the wisps that you're seeing there are fibrin that have adhered. And some of the more dense areas here are actually platelets. So this is a platelet, this is a platelet, this is a platelet cell. Um, and over top of the platelet cells is this fibrin network. It's, it's basically a spider web of all these little pieces of protein that have stuck over top. And, and stuck in them, as you can imagine, are a whole bunch of red blood cells that are also forming part of the clot. Okay, So this is going to create a patch uh, over the hole and prevent blood from escaping. And eventually those cells that are on the periphery, the ones that were ruptured, or the ones adjacent to the ones that are ruptured are going to form new cells through mitosis and then close the gap. Okay, but in the meantime, you need to put a plug in there, a cork, to prevent blood from leaking out. And that's what's happening in this clotting mechanism. It works extremely well. Um, certainly on the venous side, if you puncture a vein or if you puncture capillaries, which is most likely what happens if you cut your skin, it's mostly capillaries that are being ruptured. Um, this works extremely well to form a patch. Now, if you're rupturing a high pressure vessel like an artery, um, sometimes this doesn't work quite as well. Um, artery rupture is quite dangerous uh, because it's under such high pressure uh, and you can lose a lot of blood very quickly. Um, so you got, you got to put direct pressure on an uh, arterial bleed. Hopefully it's not too big of a, a hole in your arterial system, but, it, but it, if the hole is too big, uh, it's going to re probably require surgical repair, which is what a tourniquet is for. A tourniquet um, restricts blood flow to an arterial uh, damage uh, so that it can be repaired surgically before you uh, allow blood flow to go back to the to the artery but then you need immediate medical attention because uh, you can't leave it like that for very long so anyway uh, this is I, I'm not sure if I brought this image up earlier I think I did actually um, but this is a gentleman uh, or actually could be female actually male or female I have no idea but um, this is the just the blood vessels in the face uh, it's mostly capillaries that you're seeing, although there's some of the smaller blood vessels are there as well. Some are at the arterioles. Uh, a lot of the small, teeny, teeny, tiny um, capillaries were damaged in the process of preservation here, so you can't actually see them. But um, yeah, a lot of blood vessels running through your tissues. A lot of little teeny, tiny blood vessels, Spe especially in the face. It's one of the most dense areas in your body for blood vessels, which is kind of cool. Okay, so that's all I have up for you on the general structure here. What we're going to do now um, is get into a little bit more detail on some of this. H have I covered everything that was in the in the uh, in the note? I'm pretty sure I did. So at this point, you should be here with me. Correct? You guys have everything from the slideshow. Keep in mind that the slideshow is it's posted, so you're welcome to go back and look at it at any time. Okay, cool. So uh, what else do I have left for today? This and this. So I've got two more things that we're going to talk about today. Uh, I have a feeling we're actually going to finish early, which is awesome. Um, but I'm going to go through the anatomy of the heart, which is a little bit of a uh, refresher from grade 10 because you probably did the basic anatomy of the heart already. I might add in a little bit of extra stuff that you didn't talk about in grade 10. Certainly tomorrow uh, in the morning, we're going to go way deeper than you would have gone in grade 10 and talk about the electrical system of the heart um, and, and how that works, how you actually conduct a signal through muscle tissue in the heart. That's for tomorrow, uh, but I won't get into that today. Um, and I'm just going to talk briefly here about the structure of the main blood vessels. Okay, so that's where we're headed. I think I should be done in about maybe less than half an hour. We'll, we'll see how this goes, but ideally you'll have some extra time at the end. So, because I got some, there's some questions for you to work on as well. Um, okay, so the heart's a pump. 
You're already aware of that. I don't think that's surprising anybody. It, it has to push fluid through a complex network of vessels that, I mean, you just saw from the previous picture, go everywhere in your body, and there are kilometers and kilometers of vessels uh, in every body. Um, it pumps about 70 beats per minute at rest. At rest is kind of important there. We're going to talk more about regulating the actual rate of the heart tomorrow, so I'm not going to get into a lot of detail there. But that's about 100,000 beats a day. A lot of beats. Uh, it never gets to rest, so it's a very uh, special type of muscle fiber called cardiac muscle. Uh, that type of muscle fiber is found nowhere else in your body, uh, and it's because the heart basically cannot be tired. You can't tire the muscle fiber out as long as you keep breathing. Um, certainly, uh, you can um, reach the maximum for your heart where it can't pump any more uh, blood for your level of exertion, but it never gets tired. And, and good for you that it never does because it's not like it can rest ever other than in between beats because if it ever decides to go for a long-term rest, uh, that, that's death. So, um, yeah, it's a special kind of muscle tissue. It's, it's unlike any other muscle. Obviously, your other muscles, if you keep exercising them, they reach failure. And at muscle failure, you can no longer um, evolve uh, force from a muscle tissue. It is, it has failed. It is at its maximum capacity. And so, for example, if you, I mean, if anybody isn't here as a weightlifter, you're doing your set and you get to your last rep in the set and you, you cannot lift that weight if that's your true last rep. Uh, it is not possible to lift it any longer. Um, and it, at which point you experience failure of the muscle tissue. That can't happen in the heart. So, um, assuming you have healthy muscle tissues in your heart. Not as far as I'm aware. <laughs> I, I'm almost 100% certain that that's not accurate, Mohammed. Um, I, I've seen people have sneezing fits for uh, a long period of time. <laughs> 20 sneezes in a row. I'm pretty sure that their heart was not um, not functional during that time or they would be dead. Um I'm, I'm almost 100% certain that that's not accurate. Even if it was for a split second, even if it was delaying, that's really problematic. I don't think that's accurate. Um, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna run this by my wife. I'm gonna ask my, I'm gonna ask my wife. My wife will know the answer to that question for sure. But uh, my, my gut instinct and strong suspicion is that that's not correct. Anyway, um, there's two circuits that it pumps to. Uh, pulmonary circuit, which is to the lungs. There it's going to collect oxygen and drop off CO2, which we talked about in the respiratory system. And then there's a second circuit that goes to your body cells. That's to distribute that oxygen and to pick up CO2. So I'm going to run through the anatomy of the heart here. Again, it's probably um, review for a lot of people from last year, which is totally fine. I might be adding in a little bit of extra anatomy. I'm going to go through each of these pieces one at a time. So if you're desperately trying to write this stuff down, uh, don't worry, I'm going to go through them here one at a time. So I'm going to start on the on the right-hand side of the heart. Now that's confusing for some people because it's on the left-hand side of this diagram. Keep in mind that you are thinking of this as if the patient or the person that you're examining here is facing you. So if you are facing a person and you're looking on the left-hand side of that heart, that is the person's right, the right-hand side of their body. So when I say that this is the right-hand side of the heart and it's on the left, keep in mind that I am facing the person. This really seems to confuse people for some reason, but just keep in mind that when I talk about the right side of the heart, it's always going to be on the left side of the diagram because the person is facing you. Okay, so first of all, this is where blood returns to your heart from the body. That's where we're going to start. Okay, so we've got deoxygenated blood coming back to the heart from all of the different cells in your body through veins. That is the purpose of veins. They return blood to the heart. If you have blood going back to the heart, it's traveling in a vein. Okay, so there are two giant veins that allow blood to return to the heart. You got one on the top called the superior vena cava or vena cava. Superior in anatomical terms just means upper or above. Okay, so the superior vena cava is the one that is above. It is the upper one. Vena means vein, 
and cava means large or cavernous. So the superior vena cava is the upper large vein. Okay, it's just written in Latin. The one on the bottom, you, again, you have a big vessel coming up from the bottom, which collects blood from all of the lower parts of the body. That is the inferior, and in anatomical terms, inferior just means lower or below. So the inferior vena, vein, cava, cavernous or large. So the lower big vein is the inferior vena cava. Uh, vena cava. So I think once you know what those words mean in Latin, it's not really that confusing what this is. The lower big vein is really like a very straightforward thing to name this. <laughs> it just is just a Latin leftover. So we got the lower big vein and the upper big vein, superior inferior vena cava, and they both feed in to the right atrium, which is really a very thin uh, chamber of the heart at the top. When people do the heart dissection, a lot of people comment that this doesn't look like anything. When you actually do the dissection, it's so thin and you're just like, what's this little flap up here? That's the atrium. There's really not very much to it. And that's because it doesn't really do that much. Its only job when it contracts is to send blood into the ventricle, the right ventricle, which is down here. So we got blood coming into the right ventricle from the atrium. Uh, it doesn't have to pump it very far, and so it's very thin, and it doesn't really look like much on top of the heart. It just looks like a little flap. So it's pumping it down into the right ventricle. Now, the right ventricle is quite a bit more beefy. If you look at the the diameter here of the right ventricle, it's pretty wide. Um, and that's because it has to be quite a bit stronger. It's not just pumping blood um, directly beside it. it ha its job is to pump blood to the lungs. So in between those two chambers, the right atrium and the right ventricle, there is a valve. So the valve is this part in the middle right here. And that valve is the AV or atrioventricular valve. And it's on the right hand side of the heart. So it's called the right atrioventricular valve. Atrio for atrium, ventricular for ventricle. Because it's in between those two things, it's an atrioventricular valve. So that's the valve in between. And the purpose of a valve, um, pretty much exclusively, is to maintain flow in one direction. So after the atrium pumps and then the ventricle pumps, you don't want blood to go backwards back into the atrium again. Uh, that would be counterproductive. It would send blood backwards in your circulatory system. So in order to get blood flowing in one single direction, you need a valve. And the valve closes when the ventricle contracts and makes sure that the blood is actually going to get pushed up up out of the heart. So it's going to go up into this vessel up here. And that vessel is known as the pulmonary artery. It's an artery because it's under pressure and it's leaving the heart. Anytime blood is being carried away from the heart, away from the heart, it's traveling in an artery. So this is the pulmonary artery. And I mentioned earlier that anything pulmonary means of the lung. So the pulmonary artery is the artery of the lung. It's the artery that goes to the lung. So there, you'll notice that it splits into two here, one this way and one this way, one left and one right, because you have two lungs, one on the left-hand side and one on the right-hand side. So each one of these, it splits up and it goes to both of them, one of the left lung and one of the right lung. Probably no surprises there. Okay, so then the blood is going to go to the lungs. It gets oxygenated, so it's going to now turn bright red. Uh, and it's going to drop off its carbon dioxide. That's, that's what the role of the lungs is. And then the blood is going to have to return back to the heart again in a vein. Veins always return blood to the heart. And because this is returning blood to the heart from the lung, that's why it's called the pulmonary vein. So pulmonary just means of the lung, and vein means vessel returning to the heart. And so pulmonary vein is the vessel returning blood to the heart from the lung. The names make sense. The names make sense if you if you know what they mean. So we got the pulmonary vein takes you to now we're at the, we're at the same type of structure on the left hand side. It's basically a mirror image um, which is the left atrium. The left atrium has the same job as the right atrium which is just to fill the ventricle below it. So the left ventricle con or the left atrium contracts and pushes blood down into 
the left ventricle. So you'll notice that the meat, the actual muscle of the left ventricle is so big. It's way bigger than the right ventricle. So if you cut the heart in half, and we used to do this during our heart dissection, people would always comment that there's like one beefy side of the heart, one like strong side, and then there's like another side of the heart that's just like the little, it's sort of like somebody that's like a, um, a professional arm wrestler. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen these guys before, but they got like one big old arm because they're always working out one arm, and then they just have like a little arm on the other side <laughs> that's like not used for arm wrestling. So the heart is very similar. It has a really beefy side, a muscular side. And the reason why that side is so big is because it has to pump blood to the entire body. And that's a big job. You need a lot of pressure for that. Uh, so the left ventricle is really beefy, very thick, whereas the right ventricle comparatively is pretty pretty small. So there's really not a lot going on. Um, and it's, it, it's because it doesn't need to pump blood that far. It's only sending it to the lungs, which are right next door. Uh, whereas the left ventricle has got to pump blood throughout the entire body. Now, I left one part out. I got I to gotta jump back here for a second. My apologies. But after the right ventricle pumps, it pushes blood up, I mentioned, to the pulmonary artery. But I, mi I missed this little part in the middle here. So, you again, you don't want blood ever flowing backwards. And so there is a valve right after the right ventricle here that prevents blood from going backwards into the right ventricle. And that valve is called the tricuspid valve. The reason why it's called the tricuspid is because it has three flaps of tissue. One flap, two flap, three flap. It's a valve with three flaps. Those flaps are called cusps. So because there's three cusps, in the valve, it's called the tri, tri for three, cuspid valve. Tricuspid just means three cusp valve. Okay, so it, it's named based on what it looks like. It has three cusps, therefore it is a three cusp valve, tricuspid. Now you have the same kind of valve on the other side after the left ventricle. So that left ventricle is going to pump and it's going to send blood to the body, okay, to some big beefy arteries. And there's also a valve on this side, and that side only has two cusps on it. Again, because you don't want blood flowing backwards into the left ventricle again. But because it only has two cusps on this side, it's called the bicuspid valve. And I spelled bicuspid wrong. <laughs> How many times have I used this note and I never noticed that? That's not good. There we go. <laughs> there's no S there. It's not biscuspid. Bicuspid. Oh, geez. I wonder how many people have that in their notes from the other section. Shoot. <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to go back and mention that. There's no S in bicuspid. One other thing I want to mention is that these valves on the other side, um, in between the atrium and the ventricle, so that would be um, these valves right here. Oh, that type to color doesn't show up very well. Um, how do I show this? Yeah, the one, this, yeah, this this valve right here, okay. And there's one on the other side as well. This valve right here. This is the, those are the AV valves, right? You have them on both sides to prevent blood from going backwards out of the ventricle. Okay, so this was the left AV valve over here, or the right AV valve, and then there's a left AV valve over here. Well, if you look inside the heart, you'll notice that there's all these strings right here that are attached to the valve. And remember that that valve is under tremendous back pressure. When the, when the, when the, right, the left ventricle and the right ventricle contract, they're pushing on that valve really, really hard. And so to prevent the valve from going backwards and prolapsing, basically breaking the valve, those strings hold the valve in place and prevent it from basically going backwards and getting blown out. Those strings are your heart strings. That, 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 is, that is what they are, are actually called. They are heart strings. Uh, so when someone's, someone is like playing with your heart strings or, or tugging on your heart strings, your heart strings are an actual thing. That they are there inside of your heart. Uh, and again, another cool thing that you can see when we do the heart dissection, or apologies, when we would have done the heart dissection, um, is you can actually see the heart strings inside of the heart. They're really strong. You can pull on them. Um, if you, you can almost pull on them as hard as you want and you can't break them. 
they're, they're very strong. Um, the technical name for those is chordae tendinae. So chordae tendinae is the technical term for heart strings. But colloquially, they're just known as heart strings. And they prevent that valve, that AV valve, atrioventricular valve, from prolapsing or blowing out backwards. There's also a big beefy part right in the center of the heart, and that separates the left ventricle and the or sorry, the right ventricle and the left ventricle from each other. And that beefy part in the middle is called the septum. Now the septum is really important for the electrical activity of the heart. And we'll, we'll talk about why tomorrow. Um, it's not super functional in terms of the actual contraction of the heart, although it is muscle tissue and it does contract. Um, but it, it, its main importance is uh, in terms of the electrical conduction of the heart. So like how electricity travels through the heart during a heartbeat. And we'll, again, we'll talk about it tomorrow. So we mentioned that blood gets blasted out of this left ventricle. It goes past the bicuspid valve, and then it goes up into the highest pressure vessel in the entire body. That's this little horned part on the top here. You'll notice there's three vessels transitioning off there, one to go to the left side of the body, one to go to the right side, and one to go to the head. Um, so left arm, right arm, and head. And that big beefy vessel there is called the aorta. It is the it is extremely strong. Uh, this is another cool thing to do when we do the heart dissection, or if we were to do the heart dissection, is you can you can pull on the aorta tissue as hard as you like. It is tremendously, tremendously strong. So it, it, like I, I, I can't break it with my bare hands. Um, and the reason why it has to be so strong is it's basically like a hose to a pressure washer. It, I mean, it doesn't have 2,700 PSI in it or something like that, but it does have 3 PSI inside of it consistently. And 3 PSI is like the pressure that you'd have inside of a properly pumped up soccer ball or a football that's quite a bit of pressure in there and so you can imagine if you ever rupture your aorta um, it's generally fatal uh, because you can lose your entire blood volume in 30 seconds it does it does not take very long to pump liters and liters of blood out at 3 psi so um, this is a really really high pressure area and and the vessels are very strong in the aorta so that's it. That's the summary here of the anatomy of the heart. Now, under normal circumstances, were you taking this course in a normal year? Uh, this would be something that you would commit to memory, uh, and I would quiz you on this. Uh, however, we've completely moved off that model. So uh, I just recommend that when you're doing the quiz, obviously I'm not going to just ask you what the parts are called because you could just look that up, uh, but you should have access to this note, just like you always would in a quiz, in these quizzes anyway. Um, so that you can reference the uh, the anatomy of the heart, but I, I don't I don't quiz you on the names of things anymore because it's just there's no point to doing that. <laughs> but this is also something that would be on your first year anatomy exam. It was on mine anyway. And I, I also if you take like a cardiovascular physiology course or something, it'd be on your course exam. It was on mine. Any questions about the heart? the anatomy of the heart or the function of the heart? I'm going to, I'm oh, while, um, while I let you look over this for a second, uh, I'm really quickly, um, I'm just going to ask my wife about the, the, uh, the heart rhythm thing, the pausing on a sneeze. I, again, I think it's extremely unlikely, but she's, she's looked at a lot more ECG readings than I have to, she would know the answer. Okay, mom. This is this is a, um, a not a straightforward answer <laughs> to that question. Uh, what my what my wife mentioned was that um, when you execute a Valsalva maneuver, Valsalva maneuver is when you hold your breath and pl put pressure uh, on your thoracic cavity. So essentially, you, you like close your mouth and like push, uh, which is something that people do when they're weightlifting and stuff like that. There's there's a sometimes a breath hold. Um, when you do that, it can have a calming effect on your SA node, which we're going to talk about tomorrow what the SA node is. But it, it's basically how you, um, 
regulate your heart rate and it can potentially depress um, the activation of the SA node. In other words, if you're tachycardic, if you have a rapid heart rate, doing a Valsalva maneuver, holding your breath and pushing um, can have a calming effect on the SA node. It can slow a tachycardic heart. It can cause it to slow down, um, which is fascinating. I did not know that. Um, however, as far as I know, and as far as my wife knows, uh, and I'm going to trust the MD on this one, um, there doesn't, there's no, in, there's no actual um, restriction of the electrical activity of the heart. It doesn't pause the heart actively beating, um, but it may have a calming effect. A Valsalva maneuver may have a calming effect on how often the heartbeat is being activated. Now, that being said, uh, when you sneeze, you're not exactly executing a Valsalva maneuver, although it may increase the pressure in your thoracic cavity when you sneeze. So uh, this is a roundabout answer to your question. It's possible that, at least temporarily, a sneeze may cause a reduction in your heart rate um, through a depression of your sinoatrial node, your SA node. Again, we'll talk about the SA node more tomorrow. Um, however, actually pausing the electrical activity, my wife's never heard of that before. I've never heard of that before. It's possible that that exists, but I this is I, I've never heard of this before. About it actually pausing the electrical activity of the heart, maybe depressing heart rate at least temporarily. Um, now. Now, I, I would put a caveat on there and say that it is physically possible that exists as a, um, you, you'd have to look for a reputable source that is telling you that that is correct, um, not a blog or something. Uh, however, my, again, my gut instinct and everything that I'm hearing here is suggesting to me that that is not true from a technical perspective, although it may, um, maybe there is something to this that I don't know, but Anyway, that, that's my answer. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't appear to be true on its face, uh, although there may be a, like a an element of truth to it. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about here, and I better hurry up. I want like I said, I want to give you some time to work on these questions. Um, are the three different transport vessels in the body? So there are arteries, which we already mentioned here, always carry blood away from the heart. They're a blood vessel that carries blood away, and because they're carrying blood away. They are under pressure. Blood that is leaving the heart is under pressure. It's being squeezed through the system by the heart. So um, those they're a high pre- they're high pressure vessels, and their physiology, the way that they are com- made up, reflects that. They are designed to accommodate high pressure. Then you've got the capillaries, which are in the middle, and their job is to do gas exchange. Okay. Um, so they allow chemicals to move in and out of them. Uh, they're, they're essentially leaky. They're intentionally a little bit leaky to allow gases to go across the membrane, to allow fluids to go across, to allow hormones to go across. Um, so the, the, the capillaries contain the red blood cells, but they're more or less continuous with the intracellular fluid, which is the fluid that is between the cells. So um, there's liquid moving in and out of the capillaries although not red blood cells. The red blood cells are confined to the capillaries unless there's either a leak or there's an inflammatory response that's happening, which sometimes allows red blood cells to escape uh, into the surrounding tissue. But usually red blood cells are only leaving the capillary if they're damaged, if capillaries are damaged. And that's when, when you get ecchymosis or, or bruising. Bruising is when you've damaged a blood vessel and you get red blood cells leaking out of the capillaries. And then lastly, you've got the veins. The veins are the blood vessels that carry blood to the heart from the capillaries. So the blood has gone, it's done its job, it's dropped off oxygen, it's picked up CO2, and now it's returning back to the heart again. So that's going to be taking place in veins. Anytime you see have blood returning to the heart, it's in a vein. It's not under high pressure, and then the physiology of the vein reflects the fact that it's not a pressure vessel like the arteries are. So what do they actually look like on a on a like a closer level if you look at them? Well, uh, they have uh, oh important to mention here that these actually flow around the body deep. So there are not a lot of places where your arteries are close to the surface of your body. Actually, there's only a few. I can show you where they are. 
So these locations are places where arteries run relatively close to the surface of your body. This, they're, they're also called pulse points uh, because these are where you can actually take your pulse. When you take your pulse, you have to do that on an artery. And so you have to put your fingers on an artery in order to feel it. And so the only places you can do that are places where the arteries are close to the surface. So you've got, um, there's a temporal artery running on the surface here. You can take your pulse there. Um, the maxillary one, which is back here. Uh, there's the carotid one, which is right here. And then you can, you can take these pulse points right now if you want. You can feel it. I got my two fingers right on my carotid right here, and I can feel it pulsing. Um, you've got the brachial artery, which is in sort of like the little diamond on the inside of your elbow. You've got the ulnar and radial arteries, which are here and here, respectively. Uh, radial on the thumb side and ulnar on the other side. Uh, you got the femoral artery, which is running sort of on the inside of your thighs. Uh, or in, inside of your, like at the hip on the inside of the thigh. Uh, you got the popliteal, which is at the back of the knee. And you've got the posterior tibial, which is at the back of your foot, and the dorsalis pedis, which is on the other side. So those are the two main ones that are running into the foot. So other than those locations, the arteries are usually running close to the bone in the center. Um, and obviously for good reason. Uh, you don't want your arteries, your extremely high pressure vessels to be running near the surface because if you cut them or rupture them, it usually means that you die. So uh, it's, it's generally a good idea to bury these fairly deep. Um, if you look at the actual structure of the artery, you'll notice uh, that they have a really thick uh, epithelial layer on the outside. So that's this right here. And the reason it's thick is to hold all of that pressure in. Um, it, it, it needs to hold everything together under high pressure. And so they have a relatively thick uh, layer of connective tissue on the outside, epithelial tissue on the outside of that. That's interesting. That's interesting, Mom. That's really interesting. I, I wonder if that is that is a um, uh, like a uh, like a piece of folk. Um, I don't know what they call that folk myth uh, that is, that is common, like to other like re cultures regionally, or, or whether that's a global thing. I, because I I personally never heard that before, but that that doesn't necessarily mean that it isn't like culturally common even in North America. I don't know. So, but that that's it's interesting that you mentioned that. Um, underneath that connective tissue, which is again holding everything together, you have a really quite thick layer of muscle tissue. And you'll notice it, it's bulky. There's actually quite a bit of muscle in the artery. And that's because your arteries get to decide where the blood goes. They have the ability to constrict and get really small. If they do that, they are going to direct blood away from wherever they're constricting. They also have the ability to dilate. It's called vasodilation. And if they dilate, then blood is going to flow to the place that's dilated, right? Because there'd be, there's less resistance to flow if you make the tube really big. And you have to do this all the time. When you start exercising and running around, you need more blood to go to your leg muscles to run around. And so you vasodilate the vessels in your legs. While you're doing that simultaneously, you need to restrict the, blo the blood flow to your digestive system, to your, you know, you name it, other internal organs, because you don't want to blast them with the additional pressure that is coming through um, because your heart is increased in rate and all that. Um, and if you, don't, if you don't constrict the vessels going to your internal organs, you're going to, you're going to, send a ton of additional flow to them that is maladaptive. You don't need to be sending additional flow to your stomach while you are racing or while you are, you know, chasing a gazelle or whatever it is. Um, so your blood is going to be redirected away from your internal organs, usually through vasoconstriction while you're exercising. So <clears throat> through this system of muscle that's in your, in your arteries, vasoconstriction and vasodilation, you can direct blood to whichever area of the body you're, is, it needs to be sent to. Are you really hot and you need to sweat? Well, you got to send blood, which is essentially what you're sweating out, the water and blood, to your, the surface of your skin. 
So those blood vessels that go to the surface of your skin are going to dilate and allow more flow to come to the surface of your skin so you can sweat out a greater volume of water. Uh, have you ever blushed before? Uh, if you have, what you're experiencing is vasodilation of the blood vessels in your face. That's what, that's what you're feeling. Your face gets warm because you're redirecting blood flow to your face. That's what blushing is. So anyway, you're, you're, this is really cool that your body kind of can control where it wants to send the flow. And in order to do that, you need lots of muscle tissue. Uh, and then lastly, you've got uh, a little uh, barrier on the inside, an endothelial layer, um, which is there to protect the inside of the vessel. And we'll talk a little bit, when we talk about illnesses of the circulatory system tomorrow, we're going to talk about some places where that endothelial lining gets damaged and lots of things damage it, smoking. We're going to talk about a bunch. But um, essentially, you want to protect that um, because it protects all the layers below. So those are arteries. There are slightly smaller versions of arteries um, that are not capillaries because they're not one cell thick. They're not teeny tiny, but they're sort of like offshoots of the arteries that get smaller and smaller, very similar to the way the brachials branch out and then branch out into smaller ones. Not quite to the level of capillaries yet, not to the little tiny vessels, but just sort of smaller arteries. And those are called arterioles. So arterioles are just like the branches off of the main arteries. So that's the artery. In the middle, this, this whole network of vessels that goes in the middle, it's called the capillary network, um, are extremely, extremely small. They are only one cell thick. Uh, you would have seen them if you watched that um, documentary. And they are that's the site of gas exchange. So that, that's where the gas is actually going. Uh, oxygen is going out into tissues. CO2 is going back into the blood. All of the gas exchange happens in the capillary network. Very uh, Only one cell thick and very low pressure. And when you look at their diameter, they are only wide enough to allow a red blood cell to pass through single file. So they're just teeny, teeny, tiny little vessels. On the other end of the capillaries, when they start to come back together again, they will join up with tiny little vessels called venules, just like arterioles. They are the miniature versions of veins. So venules are going to come together and then they're going to form larger vessels called veins. So if we look at the vein in detail, I got a vein over here on the other side. As opposed to the artery, instead of being really deep in your tissue, the venous side is usually shallow. So you don't find these in deep, uh, deep. If you look at your forearm right now, you can probably see most of the uh, of the veins as they run back towards your heart. So they, they don't run deep. They're under extremely low pressure. So remember that they're on the other side of the system from the pump. So when you're on the other side of the system from the pump, there's not a lot pushing you. There is a little bit of pressure gently pushing blood back to the heart again, but it's not high pressure. So if you rupture a vein, Yes, there is flow that comes out of the rupture, but it's relatively low pressure flow. Uh, a lot of the blood being returned to your heart is actually being pushed there uh, by just muscle movement and muscle action. So as you're like moving your leg muscles around, moving your arm muscles, moving your body, that is partially responsible for returning the blood to the heart. It's actually pushing. It's, it's aided by muscle contraction. When you look at the breakdown of the tissues of the heart, You'll notice that, yeah, it has that connective tissue on the outside, but that connective tissue is very thin because, again, it's not under high pressure. It doesn't need to be this like super pressurized vessel, so it doesn't have a lot of connective tissue holding it together. There is a muscular layer in the vein, but again, compared to the artery, it's just a teeny tiny muscle. And it, to be perfectly honest, it doesn't really do very much. There's not a lot of vasoconstriction, vasodilation that happens on the venous side. Uh, there's a little bit, uh, but not a lot, and it's uh, not nearly as adaptive as the um, as, as the arterial side um, because it's not really directing blood flow to any particular location. Remember that all of the flow that's going through the veins goes back to the heart. All of these lead back to the heart. So you've got a little bit of muscle, and then you have that endothelial lining in the middle, and that's just protecting the inside of the vein. It's not under high pressure, so they don't typically get damaged the same way that arteries get damaged, which we're going to talk about tomorrow. So there's one last element to the vein, and that's because it is not under high pressure. So you have to have some system 
that prevents blood from going backwards. Otherwise, you'd have a little bit of pressure, you know, it's kind of pushing blood up, but then you might have a moment where there's a little bit less pressure and then the blood is gonna to start to go back down the vein this way and then maybe there's a little more pressure and then where you're gonna end up happening is you're gonna get blood that is just not making its way back to the heart. That's gonna to lead to clotting and all kinds of other problems. This has to stay in continuous motion and the flow has to be unidirectional. So what the veins have in them is actually a system of valves. Just like the heart has valves, the um, the, there are valves all throughout the venous system and they prevent blood from flowing backwards. So the blood will go a little ways up. That's what I have uh, shown over here. The blood will go a little ways up and then it'll fall back onto a valve. And then it'll go a little ways up and then it'll fall back onto a valve and then it'll go a little ways up and fall back onto a valve. But in this way, you're not gonna get reverse flow happening in the veins because the pressure is so low, there is always the possibility for reverse flow. And so the valves prevent backflow from happening. Okay, I went a little bit over time there. My apologies. Um, this is all for tomorrow. So there are some questions to go along with this, um, which you can complete during learning block three. They are right here. 481 numbers one to three and 486, one, two, four, and five. Probably shouldn't take you more than half an hour if you're working at a fairly moderate pace. Uh, I'm gonna let you go now. I'm gonna st stop talking. If you have questions or comments, please let me know what they are. I'm gonna, I'll be here in the in the uh, chat anyway. And then at one o'clock, I'm gonna move over to the uh, Google Meet. And again, be happy to chat with you. If you've got any questions, you wanna talk about um, the assignment, you wanna talk about literally anything from today's content. Uh, and tomorrow we're gonna get into more of the electrical activity of the heart and start to finish up this unit. All right, guys.